winter is coming. <laughs> the summer <clears throat> of affluence is over. There are forces at work in the world which, in my characteristically Eeyore pessimistic view, <laughs> threaten the very foundations of Western civilization. I'm not talking just about climate change, environmental issues, though those are certainly very high on the agenda. But I'm also talking about the emergence of a global elite which is making the mistake that elites have historically that they can get along without the rest of us. So, the upshot of this is that we are entering an age which is probably going to be different from the extraordinarily benign circumstances which I and my generation grew up in. Things are getting harsher. Resources are more limited. The Club of Rome's limitations of growth uh, may have been a little bit premature in the 60s, but we may, may actually be hitting some limits now. And when this happens, when things start to change, as Blake said, or no, Yates, I think, the center falls apart. And people move to the left or the right. And how things evolve depend very significantly on that. Historically, when things fall apart, the preponderance of people move to the right because they are afraid. They are afraid based on exactly what we know in Buddhism, the three marks. They, are, they fear for their survival. They try to avoid the pain. And they struggle to hold on to their identity and who they think they are. Unfortunately, you cannot build a society, you cannot build a civilization based on anger and fear. Anger and fear are simply the tools by which those who have power can manipulate the population. And I think we can see this in our world today, not only in this country, but elsewhere. A lot of what we're doing here is talking about technology, and people are looking to technology to mitigate or free us from this kind of evolution. So this morning, what I want to do is to talk very seriously about different, a, a different way of thinking about technology, and to a lesser extent, innovation. And if this is a little rough, I have to ask for your indulgence. I had a talk planned yesterday. I went for a walk with my friend Hokai, who's here. And he made a few comments on my ideas. They were very helpful. And though he wasn't aware of this, uh, the result was I completely rewrote my talk an hour and a half ago. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Hokai. It is, well, you will judge. <laughs> Pardon? I'll never talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's what friends are for. <laughs> so I'm, I actually am extremely grateful because it was very, very helpful. So we tend to think of technology as these kinds of things, computers, electronic stuff. That's certainly one way to think about it. 
that technology in its broader sense is a systematic way of doing things. And there are many different technologies. Uh, Chinese developed technologies for metallurgy 4,000 years ago. Uh, Buddhism is extraordinarily rich in spiritual technologies. Uh, one of the great inventions, I think it is possibly the greatest invention of the 20th century, is the psychological technology for being able to uh, stop the, uh, uh, what's it, the uh, passing on of dysfunctional family patterns in one generation. If you refer to the Bible, it says, For the Lord thy God is a jealous God, visiting with iniquity the sins of the fathers unto the children, nigh unto the seventh generation. This is a way of saying that family dysfunctions take seven generations to play themselves out. We now have the technology due to Virginia Satir and others to stop this in one generation. That's extraordinary. And innovation... People think of it as doing something new. That's nonsense. Almost all innovations consist of taking something that already exists and applying it in an area that it hasn't been applied before. The printing press, which is one of the great technological in innovations, combined movable type, which had been around for a long time, but didn't become a printing press until it was combined with the wine press, because that brought enough pressure to actually make it hit the paper. And if you look at other technology innovations, it's the same thing. New things, uh, old things in new situations. So today, I'm borrowing from Marshall McLuhan, who is a Canadian English professor in the 60s, and he had some very interesting observations about technology. And out of his thinking, I'm just going to use one of his principles, that whenever a new technology or a new medium emerges, four things happen simultaneously. An ability is enhanced, that's the first one, enhancement. Something is made obsolete, that's the second, obsolescence. Third, something is brought back from the past. We can call that retrieval. And fourth, it creates its own negation. We can call that reversal or negation. I'll call it negation. So E-O-R-N, enhancement, obsolescence, retrieval, negation. Write those down. I don't have a slide up, we're going to be using those all through this. Now, I have no idea where I am with time. How am I? I didn't take note when I started. Okay, they aren't telling me, so I'm just going to I, take it. Now, what I want to do is to, with each one of these, there's some important, just a couple of important points. Enhancement of an ability always leads to imbalance because when you're enhanced in one way, you pay less attention to other things. So, how many of you are aware of your body when you're at your computer? <laughs> you know. So, that's what I mean. And McLuhan's term for this was auto-anesthesia. Second, obsolescence doesn't mean the thing disappears, it means its position changes. Things don't just die out completely. They just, their ranking, their importance, their influence shifts. But they, they're still around, usually. We, there's still people driving horse and buggies, even though we have cars. But they're for special events, or special circumstances, or special cultures. Retrieval always involves bringing an older technology, or the principle of an older technology, back. Facebook, for instance, brings back the principle of living in a small town. Everybody knows everything about you. <laughs> you know, in a small town you live, everybody knows everything about you. On Facebook, everybody knows everything about you. You can't keep any secrets. And negation is, from a Taoist point of view, 
the way that the tech innovation balances itself. And we all know about this. How many of you live in large cities? How many of you have experienced gridlock? That's the negation with the technology of the car. Just to give you an example of this, online information uh, technology, it increases the accessibility. Everything is available. So that it enhances the individual exploration. It makes obsolete the need to travel, uh, the need to store information in libraries and so forth, because uh, they're all online and available to everybody. What does it retrieve? It retrieves the sense of an individual path, because when things become standardized knowledge, then you have to conform to those standards. But with this total wide open accessibility, you're once again free to find your own path in whatever subject matter you're interested in. And its negation, it becomes a Tower of Babel. You don't know what's good, what's bad. It's very difficult to assess quality. Uh, so you're floundering in the sea of information with fragmented attention because there's so much. That's just one example of application. Now I want to turn to Buddhism. Buddhism has successfully, some would say unsuccessfully, coped with several changes in technology historically. The first one was the development of money. Money developed in India in the latter, uh, around the beginning of the uh, common era gave rise to a middle class. If you run through the enhancement, it enhances the ability to trade. It makes obsolete the need to bring all your cattle and things to market. Uh, creates a common currency, so it makes obsolete fluctuating values. Uh, it retrieves from the past the sense of unlimited possibility, because once you move into a trade economy, the amount of wealth you can generate is not limited by the land. And so you have this infinite resources, which is how people, the first humans, felt about life, because there were very few of them, so the resources were infinite. And its negation is that it creates banks, which then control the economy and sap wealth out of it exactly the way that we're experiencing now. Its effect on Buddhism is dramatic. It created a middle class that had sufficient affluence that they did not need to renunciate life, uh, to renounce life in order to practice. They had sufficient leisure through their wealth. This becomes uh, codified or talked about in the Vimalakirti Nidesha Sutra, where Vimalakirti is a layman who puts all of Buddha's bodhisattvas and monks and the arhats and everybody to shame because his realization is deeper. Extraordinary sutra saying, Top dog here is the layman, not the monks. Huge restructuring. Arguably, it gives rise to the, uh, to the Mahayana because the presence of money fundamentally changes the relationship with, between the laity and the monastics. In the Theravadan tradition, monks have to be served by lay people. And so they're locked into a symbiotic relationship which has provided tremendous stability. But if you allow monks to handle money, and the Theravadan stayed with the original thing and said, no, we're not going to handle money, so they stayed in that symbiotic relationship, the uh, Mahayana said, oh, we'll handle money, and so uh, monasteries could become profit centers. And this changed their relationship. I got five minutes left, you're kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it changed their relationship, uh, and so uh, with the laity, and you get Nalanda, these universities, you get uh, the colleges and everything like that, working in a very different way. So now I'm going to go like crazy. <laughs> Another technology that Buddhism uh, cover, uh, encountered, which led to significant changes, was the printed word. It, uh, the printed word, xylographs, the woodblocks in Tibet and China and so forth, allow for the standardization of knowledge. McLuhan argues that's what makes democracy possible. It doesn't make it, uh, don't count on it in all situations, but it makes it possible. It get, makes slang, dialects, individual variations obsolete. Think of the l'Académie in French, which was key in bringing the French language into creation. 
It makes, uh, it retrieves the sense of, of a priesthood, an elite caste who control knowledge uh, uh, and in, in terms of librarians and scholars and so forth. And it calls into, it, it negates itself by creating authoritarian structures and standardized paths which uh, mitigate uh, or uh, reduce the chance for individual exploration. And we can see this in Buddhism. You get the Lamrim texts, the genre, in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, it also leads to the divorce of mind and body. The whole idea of an intellectual understanding is possible because of this. And very significantly, it froze the evolution of the Sangha because they had written down the codes and they became legal codes and have never changed and that has caused huge problems in today's world. What is happening now? Crafts are being turned into technologies. And one of the examples I want to give is MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. An appropriate analogy for this in my mind is aspirin. Aspirin was the first drug to be based on natural substances to be synthesized by German pharmaceutical companies, I'm not exactly sure, but late 18th, 19th, 30th, 20th century. What are the benefits of that? It's scalable. It can be made in infinite quantities and help millions and millions of people. MBSR took the essential elements of meditation, reduced it to a very well-defined protocol, made it trainable in four to six weeks, and it has benefited hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people now. When you isolate key components and make it like this, we get the same kind of thing we've been talking about. It enhances access and benefit, making it much more widely available. It makes obsolete traditional teachers such as me. Because we give, it gives rise to people who specialize in these particular areas and have much, much deeper knowledge. And so people like me, it, it, when I first started in LA, people naturally came to me for meditation. Nobody comes to me for meditation anymore. They go to uh, other places where everything's much simpler. They don't have to deal with all the vagaries of tradition. It retrieves a sense of personal path. And the negation is everything becomes highly specialized. And so the holistic sense which you find in the original traditions, is often lost. Where are we going with all of this? Well, the challenge we have now is we have accessibility to so much information. And if we think of devices like the iPhone and things like that, in which, we, in which engage, you know, the screen engages so much of our life, Sherry Turkle, who's a researcher at MIT, says there are three very powerful fantasies that these technologies are now bringing to us. One, that we will always be heard. Two, that we can choose whatever we pay attention to. And three, we will never have to be alone. When the actual result of these technologies is that they destroy solitude, but don't necessarily create connection. The world created by Google, Facebook, etc., could move in the direction of people never leaving their own worlds because they're being fed results that conform to their, expect, uh, their search interests and so forth. They only can communicate with each other asynchronously through tweeting or text message or so forth. Uh, they're they have no solitude because they're constantly engaged, but they don't actually experience real connection, and they lose their ability to have conversations. This reflects our cosmology of isolated orbs in space, in infinite space, which only, can only uh, communicate, if at all, asynchronously because of the limitations of the speed of light. What do you do here? Joseph Campbell once said, follow your bliss. I disagree. The way out of this is follow awe. Because the one thing that's clear to me is that modern culture has systematically destroyed our relationship with awe. Awe is a 
very, very important emotion. And through the presence of awe, it takes you out of your world into a sense of something that's greater than you in, and to which you feel intimately connected. Something greater than you to which you feel intimately connected. So if you want to keep a guiding principle which will steer you in this world of new technologies, this is what I would suggest. Follow your awe. Thank you. Thank you.